Recently, we've been talking about growing as God's people, growing in a spiritual way and making sure that we develop in a way that's going to help us to serve God in ways we've never done before. You know, one of the biggest problems that we're having as God's people today is so many of us are failing to grow as we should as God's people. And if you just stop and, and step back and take a look at your life, can you tell a noticeable difference in yourself from the way you were a year ago or five years ago or however long? Can you tell a noticeable difference in yourself, spiritually speaking? I'm not talking about, you know, a difference in your finances. I'm not talking about a difference in the way you look. If you're like me, as you grow older, you just get better looking as time goes on. But <laughs> some people aren't as blessed as me. I know that. But can you tell a difference in your spiritual life? You know, a lot of, for a lot of Christians, they can't. And that's a problem, and that's one of the biggest problems that we face today in the church. You know, I explained it to you last week, but if they were to hire you on at a new job, and they start training you to do that job, and after a year's time, they're still training you, you still can't do the job, wouldn't you say there's a problem? You know, when your employer hires you, they expect that after a certain amount of time that you should know how to do the job on your own. You should grow and develop in, you know, doing the things they want you to do in that job. You know, if they hire you on to deli to make sandwiches and in a year's time they're still training you and you still can't do the simple thing of making a sandwich, there's a problem there. Well, you know, if we become a Christian and, you know, after a year or two years, five years, six years, and we still can't do the most basic fundamental thing of tell people that tell people the gospel, there's a problem. So we, we got to recognize that. We have to grow. And remember Hebrews 5 verse number 12 where the Hebrews writer was speaking to his readers there and he told them that for the time that you ought to be teachers, you have need that one come again and teach to you what be the first principles of the oracles of God. You know, we recognize that our boss would not, would not accept a lack of growth from us. But it's like sometimes we turn around and we think that God ought to, ex ought to accept a lack of spiritual growth from me. We wouldn't expect our boss to accept that, but we sure would expect God to be okay with that. Well, that's not the way that it works. And sometimes when we grow, we, we try to grow, sometimes we focus so much on outward things. And we, we say to ourselves, well, I must be growing because I come to church more and I give more and I do this more. And as I said, you know, definitely that can be a sign of spiritual growth, but you have to ask yourself, am I growing on the inside? Am I growing closer to God in my devotion and my love for Him? You know, if you do grow closer to God in, in your heart, then these outward actions, that will be a natural result of that. If you give God your heart, you grow closer to Him on the inside, these, not, these outward things are going to come naturally from that. They're going to flow from that. But, you know, one big thing is some people say, well, you know, I don't feel that I'm growing, and I, I, I just feel I, I'm not growing because I don't know how to grow. Well, remember, I really don't think that's the case for most of us. I know a lot of people think that's what it is that's keeping them from growing, but let, let's just be honest. How difficult is it to know what to do to grow? I mean, let's just think about it. You know, we're supposed to grow in our Bible knowledge. Pick up the Bible. How hard is that? Oh, I don't know how to grow my Bible knowledge. Pick it up. You know, you're not going to grow in your knowledge if the Bible stays in the pew all week or it sits in your car all day long. I mean, definitely you're not going to grow if that's what you do. And you think, well, you know, I, I can't grow in my evangelistic efforts. Just tell somebody. Just tell somebody the gospel. It's not that difficult. You can tell somebody Christ died, was buried, and raised again, and you can tell them what they have to do to accept that. You can tell them that they're going to accept the gospel. They've got to hear, believe, repent, confess, be baptized. How difficult is that? You know, really the problem is not, well, we don't know what to do to grow. It's really that sometimes we don't want to do what's necessary to grow. We know what we should be doing, but it takes work. And sometimes we're just not willing to buckle down and burn the midnight oil and put our minds to it and get down and dirty with it and really get hard at work on it. And so sometimes that's what really hinders us from growing. We're just not willing to put the effort in that we should. 
That's one of the biggest hindrances that we face today. And one of the reasons we face that is because we live in a society that, you know, makes everything so convenient for us. We don't have to work for anything hardly. Everything is just, you know, handed to us. We, we have so much entertainment today, and it makes it hard for us to want to actually work and put hard work into something. So what we really need today is we need motivation. We need to be motivated to do the things that we need to do to grow. And one of the greatest things that's going to motivate us to do what we should do, what we need to do to grow, is to just tell people what we believe. If you tell the people around you what you believe, that is going to motivate you to do more for God. Because if you let people around you know what you believe and they may voice their disagreements with what you believe, they may challenge what you believe, or may, they may want to know more about what you believe. What's that going to do for you? That's going to push you and challenge you to get in the Bible more, isn't it? Because I've got to be able to talk to these folks. These folks want to know more about what I believe, and so I better get in the Bible and figure it out. I better get in the Bible and check this out. That's going to encourage you to pick that Bible up. But if you're not talking to folks, you're not letting them know what you believe, you don't really have that much motivation to get in the Bible. You don't have much of a reason for it. And then if you're not talking to folks more that's getting you involved in the Bible, that's going to make it to where you want to talk to more people. Because you realize, hey, I can talk to these people. I'm growing in my knowledge. And so that's going to encourage you to talk to more people. And that's going to encourage you in your benevolence because you're thinking, hey, I'm becoming more involved with people. That's going to make it easier for me to want to go out and help people more. And you look at the first century church. You know, so many times we, we want to get our motivation for, for spiritual growth. We want to get our motivation to serve God from just hearing a sermon once or twice a week. That's where we suck all our motivation from, is from that quick 20-minute sermon. A quick 20-minute sermon is not going to get you going for the whole week. You know, if you look at the first century church, I don't see those Christians in the Bible saying, well, what we need to pump us up and get us going for God this week is we need a quick 20-minute sermon. And yeah, that'll, that'll do it. What they did was, like I've been telling you, they told people what they believed. That's what motivated them. That's what made them so on fire for God, and that's what got them to being so faithful to Him. Because we look at the Bible and we see these Christians of the first century, and we think, wow, look at these people. Look at how dedicated they were. Look how they were growing. What was their secret? Their secret was they told people what they believed. They didn't just come and sit in a building and hear a couple of sermons and think, yeah, that's good. They heard sermons, they heard lessons, but there was a lot more to it than that. And so that's what we need if we're going to grow. Now last week, these are the things that we covered, and I was kind of mostly dealing with growing as an individual. You as a Christian, you developing personally. But what I want to do today is I want us to talk about growing together as the collective body of Christ. I want to talk about growing as the church. Let's start by looking in Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse number 18. Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 18. Now, the book of Ecclesiastes is a book that we don't really go to very often. But all throughout this book, there are many principles and many lessons here that we can learn from. Ecclesiastes chapter 10, he said, look here at verse 18. Ecclesiastes 10, 18, Solomon says, By slothfulness the roof sinketh in, and through idleness of the hands the house leaketh. All right? Solomon lays out a very simple principle. If you are an idle person, you just sit back, you don't really worry about anything, you just sit on the sidelines, you just observe things, you don't take care of your house. He uses this, this as an illustration. If you see that your house is starting to fall apart, but you refuse to do any kind of maintenance on it, to do any kind of upkeep on your house, the house is going to decay away, roof's going to cave in, the house is going to be no good. We all recognize that if we want our house to last a long time, if we want our house to stand, that we have to do some work on it from time to time. 
If the heat goes out in your house, you can't just sit there and say, oh, well, just grab a blanket. You're going to freeze. Or if your roof starts leaking, you know, you can say, well, well I'm not going to fix that. Just put a bucket under it. Well, if you keep doing that, and you keep doing that, and you keep putting stuff off, and you never take care of your house, eventually that house is just going to collapse in. Very simple principle. You can't be idle when it comes to taking care of your house. All right? Here's what I want us to do. That's a very simple principle here. We read this verse and we think, of course. We all recognize that. Keep that thought in mind. Let's go to the New Testament. Let's go to 1 Peter 2, verse number 5. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse number 5. You know, in a spiritual way, we are God's house. As the people of God, as Christians, we are the house of God. Peter says here in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse number 5, he says, Ye also as living stones are built up a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Y'all, we are God's spiritual house. And we recognize that a physical house is not going to stand through idleness. If we just stand on the sidelines and watch the house decay away, it's not going to last. Well, the same thing is true when it comes to God's house. If we want God's house to stand... If we want the church to succeed, then you and me cannot just sit on the sidelines and be a mere observer of things. And that's what we have a lot of today in the church. So many Christians want to get away with doing nothing, and if they have to do something, they want it to be the bare minimum. But they just want to go unobserved, don't want, don't want any attention on me, I don't, want, I don't want anybody to notice me, I don't want to do anything, just want to you know, observe a few things and go home. And it, let's just think about it. Let's just be real here. Imagine if every Christian had that attitude. Nobody wanted to do anything. We'll put it off on so-and-so or put it off on him. And, well, I can't do that. He can. And, you know, we just shrugged all these responsibilities. We just shrugged off all of these tasks. You think the church would be in a good situation if that's what everybody did? Obviously not. The point is, if the church is going to succeed, we all have a part that we need to play. We cannot afford to have people who sit idly by and do nothing. Everybody has a part to play, and if everybody would do something to help out, y'all, we could change the face of this planet. You know, one reason I think, though, that we have so many members who just sit by and sit on the sidelines and just want to be an observer is because some people think that they just can't be of any use. You know, I've heard people say things like, well, you know, I haven't really been much help all these years and, you know, what makes me think that I can be of any help now? I'm not a preacher. I've heard people say, oh, I'm, you know, I'm not educated, I'm not that smart, so I can't, I can't be of any use. You know, I actually heard one, one man years ago, a man I actually really looked up to and I thought was one of the smartest men I ever saw in my entire life, knew the Bible like the back of his hand. And I was talking to him one time about, you know, evangelism, and he just looked at me and he said, I can't teach anybody. And I thought, hey, you know, what do you mean you can't teach anybody? My heart sank when he said that because I thought, well, if you can't teach anybody, what makes me think I can? And I, that just really disheartened me because I thought of all people, I thought, you know, this would surely be a person who would be all for that. He knows the Bible so good. And yet he had that kind of mentality. So many times we shoot ourselves down. We think, well, I can't be of any good. When we really could be. But we just don't see it because we keep telling ourselves that we, we're, we're no good. We're, we're, we're not important. Well, I'm, I'm, not, I'm just, I'm too, I'm too small of a person. What can I do? Let's look at this scripture. Let's look in 1, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And let's begin in verse 14. First Corinthians 12, verse 14. 
Even the smallest member of the church can make a big difference. No matter how small you may be, you have got a role to play to keep the church going like it should. 1 Corinthians 12, let's start reading in verse 14. Paul says, For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot shall say, Because I am not the hand, I am not of the body. It is not therefore not of the body. And if the ear shall say, Because I am not the eye, I am not of the body. It is not therefore not of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where are the smelling? But now God hath set the members, each one of them, in the body, even as it pleased him. And if they were all one member, where were the body? But now they are many members, but one body. You think, well, what's all this about? What, what is he talking about? Okay, well, remember that the Bible describes the church as the body of Christ. It compares God's church to a physical body. He's making a comparison here. And the point Paul is making here is that, you know, your physical body has a lot of different parts. Eyes, ears, nose, all these different body parts. And these parts all come together and they all have a role that they play and it makes it to where we can function. Now, Paul kind of gives an illustration here and he says, you know, well, what about, you know, your ears? What if the, your ears were to say, well, you know, I'm not, I'm not the eyes, so I'm not important. Or the nose was to say, well, you know, I'm not the ears, so I'm not important. Well, they're important. You know, they may have different roles, but they're still important. Some people may say, well, I'm not a preacher, I can't do anything. Just because you're a preacher don't mean you can't do anything. You know, what it, think about it this way. Let me, let me show you that even your smallest body part that you may think is nothing makes a big difference. What if your knee, just, just you know, illustrating your body, personifying it here, what if your knee was to say, well, I'm not important. I'm not a heart. I'm not a lung. You know, I'm not the eyes. Those are all vital organs. Those are all important things that you have to have to function. I ain't nothing but just an old kneecap. What do I do? I've been back and forth. Big deal. I'm not important. So who cares if I do anything? Who cares if I do my job? I'll just go out. You think you could function if your knee went out? Probably not. How many of us would be walking if our knees went out? None of us. You know, we, sometimes we take body parts like that for granted. It's the old knee. That old knee don't do nothing. That old knee keeps you going. It may not be a heart. It may not be the lungs. But that don't mean it's not important. You may think, well, I'm just a small, average, just Joe. I'm just an average Joe person here. I can't do it. You're important. God needs you. We need you. You have a part to play. But then you have some members who don't feel that way. You know, some members, of course, feel that they're not important. But you do have some members who sit idly by when they know good and well that they could do more. They honestly know that they could, but they just refuse to. And one, one thing that always gets me is, I'm thinking to myself, most of those people who refuse to grow and to challenge themselves spiritually won't do that when it comes to anything else. When it comes to finances, when it comes to sports, when it comes to hunting and fishing, all this other stuff, boy, we will make sure that we challenge ourselves to do things we've never done before. We'll go way outside of our comfort zone. We'll push ourselves. We'll challenge ourselves. And we'll do new things and we'll grow in ways we've never done before. But we come to church, we come to serving God, and all of a sudden it's, well, you know, I'm shy and, oh, I don't want to. Something's wrong there, y'all. Something is, is terribly wrong when we do that. You know, with our kids playing sports, what if you were trying to teach your kid to do some new pitch? And your kid said, I don't know, Dad. I, I don't want to do anything new. I, you know, I, I can't. You wouldn't let your kid get away with that. You would say, uh-uh. Oh, Dad, I'm not comfortable getting outside my comfort zone. Uh-uh. You're going to learn this pitch, boy. We ain't going to let him get away with that. But we turn right around with ourselves when it comes to church. And we ain't going to challenge ourselves to do anything new. We're just going to keep coming up with all these excuses and all these reasoning about why we can't do it. Y'all, God sees that. I hope you know that. You, do you, have we forgotten the parable of the talents? You remember the, the master came and he gave his, ser his servants certain talents? 
And remember, he gave one servant one talent. Now, by the way, a talent does not refer to talent like we think of, of, you know, being gifted at doing something. Oh, you're such a, a talented painter. That's not what this means. A talent is a piece of money. The master gave this servant one piece of money to use in his service. What did the guy do with it? Well, I don't want to get outside my comfort zone. Yeah, I, you know, I don't want to do this. I don't want to challenge myself to serve my master in new ways that I've never done before. I don't want to challenge myself to, to do anything that might make me uncomfortable. That I'm just going to hide this little piece of money. I'm going to sit on the sidelines. I'm just going to be a mere observer. Watch everybody else with their talents go out and serve the master. I'm just going to watch. Okay, that's what he did. He did it. What happened when the master came back? Oh, buddy, he gave the master all them excuses he'd been hiding behind all these years to justify it. Oh, buddy, he let the master have it. Oh, master, I knew the kind of man you was. Yeah, I knew if I spent that talent, it might, it might not have come out good like you wanted it to. And I was worried about it. And yada, 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 yada. Boy, he laid it all on the master. He laid it on him thick. What did the master say? Oh, I, per I, I perfectly understand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Good thinking. I'd have done the same thing. Good thinking. Good job. He didn't do that. The master told him, look, you had the ability to take this money that I'd given you and to do more with it. Y'all, we have the ability to do more things for God than we're doing sometimes. You know, why is it that we won't push ourselves in these areas? And I'll, I'll tell you right now, I can be just as guilty as y'all because there's been a lot of times in my life where I'm thinking, man, you know, I could have done that. There was no sense in me coming up with these excuses. I think we've all probably done that from time to time. But we've got to learn that if we're going to grow spiritually, we have to push ourselves. You have to. If you don't push yourself, you will never grow. That's a part of it. And it's like I told you before, you know, that, that, that goes back to the thing about growing takes work. It takes effort. And that scares people sometimes. And it makes it to where, you know, sometimes we just don't really, really we even want to fool with it. Why fool with it if it's going to be so hard? But y'all, here's the thing. If we really love God, and He really is the central focus of our life, and He's really what we're living for, then y'all, we need to make every effort to do for God what He's done for us. I mean, think about it. Y'all, God gave His all for you and me. And He expects that in return. He expects us to give our life to Him. Our life doesn't need to revolve around money. It doesn't need to revolve around this. It doesn't need to revolve around that. It needs to revolve around God. And we need to make sure that we're doing what we can to grow in that. Because it's so easy for our lives to get drug off into something else. So we need to grow together as the church. And one of the things about, you know, challenging yourself to grow is that's why we have other brethren. That's why we're the church. We are supposed to challenge each other to grow better. You know, growing is a team effort. So many times, the reason... Many Christians fail to grow like they should is because they are looking at it from the wrong perspective. I'm on my own. It's all up to me. I have to do this by myself. You don't have to do it by yourself, and God doesn't expect you to do it by yourself. God expects us, like Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 and 25 says, for us to come together and to provoke one another to love and good works, encourage each other. That's why we are the body of Christ. Growing is a team effort. And no matter who you are, no matter how small or insignificant you think you are, you have a part to play in the church or something you can do for God no matter who you are. So let's make sure that as we go forward in the week that we challenge ourselves in new ways. And I understand that, you know, again, you have to recognize growing takes time. But just take baby steps, if nothing else, just as long as you are making that your goal to do more. Any little step can help. 
any little, you know, any little thing can help you to move towards that goal. Inch by inch even. Even if it's just an inch, you're getting closer. I mean, if you do an inch every day, eventually that inch is going to turn into a mile. Just keep working at it, keep going, and we'll grow for God. If you're here this morning, you're not a Christian, then as always, we want to give you the opportunity to obey the gospel. The Bible says if you'll believe in Christ, if you will repent of the sins you've committed, confess His name before men, and then be baptized, you can have your sins forgiven by the grace of God. If you're here, you are a Christian, but you've strayed away, then we also want to give you the opportunity to come back. If we can help you in any way this morning, then why don't you please let it be known as together we stand and sing.